Okay, so as I told uh, Deep when he asked me to give this talk to you guys, I am a clinician, I am not a basic scientist, although um, I will try to tell you what at least the clinical people kind of think about the science behind this um, connection, but this is the, the point of me being here is for you guys to pick my brains about um, maybe the, the clinical side. So uh, if we talk about treatment, I might um, discuss non-FDA approved medications, which is not very important to you since you are not in the United States. Um, I was a member of the APA DSM-5 Neurodevelopmental Workgroup, so I was responsible for um, partly responsible for taking Asperger's out of the DSM-5. So those of you who are upset about that, we can uh, put a target on my back. Um, and I am working with a few pharmaceutical companies um, testing out new products. So what I wanted to do today is kind of talk about this connection between epilepsy and autism. You know, what's the concept? What are the numbers? What are the risk factors? What does it really mean? to a clinician and, and then hopefully for you guys to, to as, as some basic science um, and then show you some of the science that I think is, is relevant and you can maybe correct me. Um, so the concept is that there is this overlap between epilepsy and lots of neurodevelopmental disorders. You know, I happen to be an autism person, so I, I put autism in there. I think uh, at the last INSAR meeting, we talked a lot about maybe the definition of autism and, and focusing only on autism is, is being less and less helpful as time goes along. Um, but you know, here we are. Um, so what we know is the association is frequent. We know it has really a major impact on patient quality of life. Um, and we believe it's representing common neural mechanisms. So the symptoms really overlap. When I was a child neurologist um, in training uh, at UCLA, you know, the, the parents would often come in and say, my kid's seizures are actually under pretty good control. What I am having trouble with is the language disorder or the cognitive disorder, or especially the behavioral disorder. Um, and that, of course, we know is a big problem in autism spectrum disorder as well. And so one of the big questions is, is there really any causal relationship or is this kind of epiphenomenon, right? So one of my would-be mentors, Shlomo Shinar, um, who's at Montefiore in, in New York, is a big epilepsy guy. And, um, you know, he says in his way, bad brains do badly. Right. So, you know, is it is it just is there something about autism that actually causes epilepsy or is there something about epilepsy that actually causes autism? Or is it that the substrate is is predisposing to both conditions? And I think we really don't know the answer to that. And I think that's a really important um, research question. But there are a lot of challenges to research, right? So there's heterogeneity both in autism, as we know, um, but also in epilepsy. So you know the the um, the autisms that people talk about, but they the same thing is true in epilepsy. They talk about it that way as well. Um, there are lots of different epilepsies. The fields of investigation are really different. Um, so there are there are psychologists and behavioral scientists who are looking at the at the behavioral side there are the basic scientists and then you know epilepsy is is mostly studied in clinically and in, in the neurology side and i would say i'm a autism neurologist but there aren't that many of us right so um so i think psychiatry and developmental peds are the people who tend to study the the autism so and they don't necessarily know epilepsy um so that idea that that the fields are disparate i think is one of the reasons that we know less than we should about this connection um, and then there are diagnostic differences. And, and this is where I say definitions actually matter, right? 
So um, a seizure, just for you guys, for the non-clinicians in the group, is a sudden disruption of brain's normal electrical activity accompanied by altered consciousness and or other neurologic and behavioral manifestations. Seizures can be provoked by an outside or, or internal source. Um, something uh, uh, easy provoke seizure would be alcohol withdrawal, uh, head injury, uh, febrile seizures, or it can be unprovoked, um, meaning it just kind of happens out of the brain. Epilepsy, um, you know, it's the word we want to use. Um, some people don't like it. It has some stigma, so they call it a seizure disorder, but it really is epilepsy. And what it is, is a condition characterized by recurrent seizures, more than one unprovoked seizure. So a single seizure does not make epilepsy. Two plus makes epilepsy. And that's important because when you start to look at the numbers, it turns out people weren't using the same kind of definitions. Um, and then autism, I don't have to tell you guys, lots of different sets of diagnostic criteria over time now with the SM5 and I think with ICD-11, although I am not, I'm not privy to what's happening there, I think um, the idea will be the, the spectrum disorder. So, so the, the numbers, um, epilepsy has definitely increased in autism, but the rates are hugely variable, right? You will find a paper in the literature that was published in a reasonable journal that says it's, you know, one or 2%. And then you'll see a paper that says it's 60%. And, and that's just ridiculous, right? So, so what do we do with that information? And, and as I looked at this, and I've looked at it with a few of my trainees over the years, and, and the, the um, table you're gonna see coming up is, is something I did um, in, a, in a review paper, but I think sample ascertainment, I mean, there's, there's the sample characteristics are, are the reason that there's so much variability here. So there's sample ascertainment, right? Population-based have lower rates than clinic-based, there's age, Turns out there's a bimodal age of onset of epilepsy in kids with autism. So it can happen early, so either preschool or, or school age, or they can happen in adolescence. And when I say adolescence, it's not kind of puberty. It's not 12, 13, 14. It's 19, 20, 21. It's really late adolescence. Um, and I don't think we know the reason for that. Um, there was a, a nice paper by Patrick Bolton that actually, for the first time, kind of counted. We always knew about this bimodal distribution, but kind of counted how often is it in this later time, and it's probably half of them, at least. Um, then including kind of non-idiopathic autism, you know, neurogenetic syndromes, brain injury, they predispose to epilepsy. Um, and so if you have a lot of those in your sample, you're gonna have a higher epilepsy rate. And then there's a lot of issues with IQ and language skills. So IQ, almost all studies are gonna show that lower IQ is associated with epilepsy. There are some studies that show language regression and poor language skills predict epilepsy. Um, back and forth, some say yes, some say, say no, and I'm not really sure why. This was a, um, a table that we included in, in one of the um, review papers we did. And basically, just to show you, right, this idea of here's a clinic-based sample, including adults, um, where you get this very high number, 46%. Here are more population-based samples, um, and you get much lower rates, right? So that shows it. Here's your effective age. Here's kids. 13%, here's all adults, 25%. Here's effect of the comorbidity or the syndrome. So with intellectual disability, 21% um, without intellectual disability. This is a, a nice uh, meta-analysis paper. Um, so I found just this morning, actually, um, something I'd missed that came out a year and a half ago, um, a big systematic um, review, um, which is lovely, right? Um, 74 studies, 283,000 participants, and you still get this. Look at this range. I mean, so yeah, it's nice to be able to use a number, but what does that number even mean? I mean, yes, it's there, there's still, 
if you if you do a meta analysis, you're still using all of those papers. So um, I think we have to be a little bit um, careful. It was interesting to me that um, that in excluding the syndromic epilepsy or the kind of developmental delay um, didn't reduce the numbers very much. Um, so that was that was a little new to me, but. Um, so, you know, clinically, um, there is a lot of overlap between epilepsy syndromes and autism. So um, one of the most common causes of uh, epilepsy or common epilepsies in babies is something called infantile spasms. Um, and it can come from a lot of different causes, um, but uh, people with spasms, babies with spasms grow up to have very high rates of intellectual disability, but it turns out their social communication deficits are actually more than would be expected for their IQ. Um, so there seems to be something different about that intellectual disability and that, that predisposure to social communication deficits and, and autism. Um, there are uh, 10 to 15 percent of these kids who have spasms go on to develop autism. And if you look in an autism community, there's maybe 6 percent. This is, you know, a small sample, but 6 percent that had um, spasms in their history, or if you look at ASD with epilepsy, 30% of them had spasms. Um, tuberous sclerosis complex, which you guys probably know about, is a, is a neurogenetic condition um, with very high rates of epilepsy, high rates of autism, um, and uh, there's been lots of people looking to say what predicts the autism in kids with TSC. Lots of um, suggestions. This is something that, that Patrick Bolton um, and his lab spend a lot of time on. Um, and I don't think we know for sure yet. Um, and then when I was in training, actually, when I was in medical school, um, the idea of uh, a connection between a very rare disorder called Lando Kleffner syndrome and autism came out. Um, there was a TV, you know, 20, 20 or 60 minutes or something like that, that, that came out. And the next day I was actually on my pediatric neurology rotation and the phones were ringing off the hook. But what somebody said on this TV show was that kids with Lando Kleffner looked like they had autism. So these are kids who have typical development up to a point and then really abruptly lose their language. And by losing their language, they start to look quite autistic. They pull in, it's as if they can't understand the world around them. They start having behavioral problems. Um, I don't think there's as much, I've known a lot of kids with Linda Kleffner and I don't think they look like they have autism, but this, this show said it. And so everybody called up and said, my kid needs a 24 hour EEG, their autism's treatable, right? You know, so that was a, um, that was a, uh, uh, interesting experience. Um, but I do think that there's probably a spectrum along which autism and epilepsy lie. Lando Kleffner may be on one end of it, spasms may be on another end of it. Um, there is no single epilepsy syndrome in autism, which is kind of too bad. Um, there are epilepsy syndromes where you can say, your child has X and they're going to have these kind of seizures and their seizures are going to be easy to treat or they're going to be hard to treat. And we use this kind of medicine on them and they, you know, this kid might grow out. So um, benign Rolandic epilepsy, almost everybody grows out of it. Lando, um, or sorry, Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, nobody grows out of. So there are these epilepsy syndromes where you can really predict and say things about the epilepsy. And that's just not true in autism, which is annoying, right? So you have lots of different seizure types. There's um, focal seizures, there's generalized convulsive seizures, there's absence, which are the little staring spells. Um, and you can see them all. And if you look at seizure behavior, the, the big ones are easy, right? Nobody misses that. But there's um, these partial seizures or, or focal seizures and absence seizures 
there's a little bit of um, overlap with what kids with autism look like, right? So here's, there's a period of unresponsiveness. Well, how do you try to get somebody to respond as you call their name and in autism, they don't answer to their name. Um, there can be eye deviation and focal seizures. Kids with autism sometimes have unusual visual inspection of things and peer out of the corners of their eyes. There can be repetitive behavior and focal seizures. They, they call them automatisms. We call them stereotypies, right? And so when I give this talk to parents, I get like 17 people lined up at the end saying, my kid's seizing all the time. And I say, no, 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 <laughs> no, I'm sure they're not. Um, but it is, it, it's sometimes hard for even really good epileptologists to tell the difference um, between seizure and behavior. And I think that that probably also contributes to the differences and the difficulty coming up with, with the numbers. So what I tell families is that, you know, seizure behavior is really involuntary. Autism behavior, we can go back and forth about whether, you know, stereotypies are voluntary or not, but, but um, you can't stop uh, uh, automatism in the middle of a seizure. You can usually get kids to stop their stereotypies. Um, and you can make them look at something else if they're peering out of the corners of their eyes. So, um, so that's the difference and that's the way families can tell the difference. What do we know about risk factors of developing epilepsy? So we talked about the intellectual disability and, and you know, I said most, but not everyone. So epilepsy is, is associated. And I showed you this meta-analysis where kind of 21% if you include ID, um, at eight percent without, so you know that's that's a that's a doubling factor. Um, comorbid conditions, kind of syndromic or non-idiopathic autism. There's there's somewhere between a two to five uh, uh, times increased risk. Um, girls turns out have more um, uh, epilepsy, um, and again, most but not all. Um, and then this question of developmental regression, um, there are some studies that show, you know, if there's a kid who has very typical development up until two and a half and then has a massive regression, we as neurologists will put that kid in an EEG and make sure that that's not an epileptic encephalopathy. Um, but not all the studies show that there's an association. So I don't really know what to do about that. And then there's some evidence of, of kind of pre and perinatal factors. So there's a, a finished birth cohort study that showed prematurity, birth weight, low APGAR scores will, will increase the risk, which doesn't surprise you because that probably means there was some neurologic damage. So, you know, what does it mean? Um, and this is again, a, a kind of clinical, um, question, and, and I guess I would say to you guys as a, as a research group, what is your research going to mean to the families, right? How is this going to impact the families? Um, we're not really sure about the, the treatment refractoriness. Um, there was this paper that came out of the NYU Epilepsy Center. So again, let's think about ascertainment, right? So NYU is a big epilepsy center. Um, and, and they say that treatment refractory patients are common. Well, who goes to a big epilepsy center, you know, a tertiary care epilepsy center, but the kids who can't get controlled. So I think, um, you know, even at a big epilepsy center, 30% of them almost were seizure free. So, so what I usually tell people is the seizures aren't so bad depending on, on, um, on kind of when they come and, and maybe what the underlying um, uh, disorder is. But this paper was scary, right? So this was a paper that looked from um, Department of Developmental Services data in the state of California and said um, it increases mortality. Um, and there is a big push in the epilepsy community right now to really look at and talk about sudden unexplained death in epilepsy or SUDEP. Um, I actually just gave a talk for the Autism Science Foundation, their first um, 
what they hope will be an annual um, named lectureship for one of their big supporters whose child died just this past year um, from epilepsy. And, and we really don't know very much specifically in autism. So what I did was kind of talk about SUDEP in general and recognize that if 20% of kids with autism have epilepsy, then you have to, those 20% have to know about SUDEP. Um, I work with a group called the Duke 15Q Alliance, um, which is a, a parent group um, for kids with duplication of chromosome 15Q. Um, and we had a rash of unexplained deaths in those kids um, over the past 10 years, um, which has been very, very scary. And we're kind of trying to figure out, not all of them even had epilepsy, so we couldn't call it SUDEP. Um, and some of their epilepsy was very well controlled. And we don't, we usually think of SUDEP in, in kids whose epilepsy is not well controlled. Um, and then there was a paper that came out in 2013, and I haven't seen more of these, which I was kind of glad about, but um, it actually said epilepsy, but among other medical problems were associated with lower adaptive function scores in terms of the impact of early intervention, right? Like that scared me, the idea of, well, if your kid has epilepsy, the, the intervention's not gonna work as well. And that I think we really have to understand. And is that again, the substrate of the brain and not necessarily to do with, with epilepsy. So it might've had more to do with their cognitive impairment. We'll see. Um, really not very much is known about epilepsy and the autism clinical profile, which I find interesting. You know, I, I always just, that, that to me kind of, I'd love to be able to look at a kid with autism at three and say your child because of this is more likely to develop epilepsy. And we just don't know the answer to that. So there was a retrospective clinical review that showed kind of lower social scores, more medication use for kids um, with, uh, with epilepsy. So this is a big um, group of, of people with autism. Um, there was a study that used the DISCO um, and uh, looked at age and IQ match samples between autism with epilepsy and autism without epilepsy. And they found there were certainly more motor and adaptive behavior deficits in those with epilepsy. There was one item in the nonverbal communication, the stairs too long and too hard. I thought that was kind of interesting. I wasn't sure what to make of that one. <laughs> um, but then several items on the social interaction scale. Um, so again, the, the kind of maybe the worse your social communication is, the more likely you are to develop um, uh, epilepsy. Um, and then there was a, a paper that basically said epilepsy makes everything worse. It was true in kids with autism. It was true in kids with developmental delay without autism. Just having epilepsy on top of, of your other neurodevelopmental disability makes things worse. So then you say, are these associations independent? So there was a lovely graduate student at Brown um, who decided to, to kind of look and try to see in some big samples that already existed. She was a statistical geneticist, so that's what she was really looking at. Um, uh, but this was designed to examine the clinical characteristics. But it was a sample of convenience, right? So it was the sign and simplex collection, which didn't ask much about epilepsy. So the, the epilepsy data in the sign and simplex collection, sadly, was, was not, it was just, do you have seizures or not? Um, agree, which was that gene bank that I told you about that I did, but you know, there's only 500 families in that, in that group. Um, and we did a good, epilepsy, because I took all the data, we did a good epilepsy um, uh, history, and then a group um, of a lot of the Boston autism groups um, called the Boston Autism Consortium. So it had really good diagnostic data um, for autism. It had uh, behavioral uh, phenotyping data, but not great epilepsy data. 
Um, and so the initial analysis, I got very excited. I was on her committee, um, showed significant effects of regression, of language, of IQ, of adaptive function, even of ASD severity, if you looked at the ADOS severity scale. Um, and then she figured, let's adjust just for IQ and almost everything went away. So here we are, right, saying, so here's, here's what got me excited and here's what got me less excited, <laughs> right? So IQ really is driving things and the age is driving things. Um, so, so the time of, at which you develop your epilepsy um, uh, yeah, the time at which you develop your epilepsy. So, you know, here we are. I think it's, I think it's a, an area ripe for clinical research. Um, I think the issue is, is we got to find the samples where both the good autism data and the good epilepsy data are there. And, and right now, I don't think they are. So in reality, I think there's kind of multiple kinds of epilepsy and autism. I think there are times when early onset seizures actually contribute, um, and that I would say infantile spasms. I think there are other disorders that coexist. So tuberous sclerosis, Dravet syndrome, Fragile X, this 15Q duplication I told you about, neurologic in injury, severe intellectual disability, and then you know, even without those things, there is this increased risk of epilepsy in plain old idiopathic autism. And I say, whatever that means, right? When I was in medical school, I learned that idiopathic stands for we're idiots and we don't know the pathology, right? So um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit, I'm just looking at the time I wanna, get done um, and, and I'm not gonna spend much time on the science because I think you guys know this way better than me, but um, I just wanna tell you that there is this issue of epileptiform EEGs even without clinical seizures. And it's been reported you know, way back 20, almost 25 years ago now by Isabel Rappin and Roberta Tuchman um, in a big sample from Montefiore. Um, and uh, these are the data. So 14% had um, uh, epileptiform EEG. If you look at the number when you have epilepsy, which you would assume has a background EEG abnormality, but it was, if you have no seizures, 8% of them had an epileptiform EEG. Um, and you get much higher yields if you do 24 hour EEGs now. For those of you who are clinically inclined, they're hard to do on kids with autism. <laughs> you have to put 20 leads all over their, their head and you have to get them to stay in the hospital overnight, but, um, but we can do it. Um, and so, you know, what does that mean, right? This, this to me is, is something that it, should we be looking to try to treat that and, and is that a, a kind of biomarker? Um, so I'll whip through this just because um, this is what you guys do, but this is what we as clinicians kind of think about is um, pathways, cells, and genes, right? Um, and there are certainly lots of reasons to think from a pathway standpoint, the kind of disconnection theories, the um, synaptopathy theories, the excitatory inhib inhibitory imbalance, which I've been told by most of my basic science friends is way too simplistic a uh, concept. Um, but you know, as a as an epileptologist, that's exactly what it is. It's too much excitation and not enough inhibition. Um, and so we use GABA drugs, that increase inhibition, or we use um, uh, excitatory neurotransmitter blocking drugs um, to, to try to treat epilepsy. Um, and then there's a ton, you know, every week there's a new overlapping genetic disorder, right? That, that gives you both epilepsy and autism. Um, and I think the other thing to think about, so Francis Jensen, who is now the chair of uh, neurology at, um, at uh, Penn um, was at Children's when I first got here, and um, and she really was starting to think about this. She was a developmental 
um, biologist and a developmental epileptologist. And she started thinking about kind of what is, she, she thought a lot about what causes epilepsy and, and the development of epilepsy. And she found there are a lot of ideas about the kind of the same critical period, synaptopathies, activity dependent pathways. Um, there are certainly a lot of evidence for epilepsy in the, in the human autism syndromes and in the animal models. Um, and, you know, these are her slides, um, just kind of thinking about all of the different um, epilepsy syndromes that we think about, but we also think about all of these as neurodevelopmental disabilities as well. Um, this is her, um, her kind of thinking about how things change in the developing brain, the switch from GABA being excitatory at the beginning to being inhibitory um, and this critical period. Um, and if you start thinking about it, you know, neonatal seizures, then spasms, then Lindo Kleffner, and then benign Rolandic epilepsy, um, these are all the same time as you see the appearance of autism, right? So, um, and, and the reason I'm interested in this and the reason that as a clinician, I counsel families to get genetic testing is because I think we're understanding more about these syndromes, right? And if we now understand mechanism and design therapies that are mechanistically related, then the family wants to know I'm in that group of, of autisms, right? And, and should we do this? Um, and then this paper came out, um, which made me think, oh, I'm glad there are a lot more smart people thinking about this than me, because I would think, oh, well, you know, here we, here we are with TSC, we know there's an MGUR problem. And so all we have to do is increase, right? But fragile X is the MGLUR problem on the other direction, right? So then when you put these two mice together, you actually uh, um, come back out with your uh, normal um, electrophysiological phenotype. Oops. So if you had used the thing that you designed for TSC in the fragile X, mouse, you would have made them worse and the same way around. So, I mean, I think we do have to think about as we're designing mechanistic therapies, you guys who are thinking about the basic science have to be um, telling us as clinicians, what can we lump and what can we not lump? Um, but, you know, here's one, um, the, the data from animal models of really reversing deficits, and there were a rash of these, right? There was RET, and there was tuberous sclerosis, and there was NF, and, and there were all of these papers that were coming out in animal models where the deficits were getting re really wiped out by treatment. Um, and so in TSC, there was this idea of if you treat the mechanism, if you use an mTOR inhibitor, could you actually prevent the epilepsy and would that reduce the risk of autism as well? Um, and and um, I think, you know, there's a, there's a study doing that now. It's called the PREVENT trial. And they're assumed, they know these kids have TSC. They're diagnosed often prenatally because they've got a, a um, uh, rhabdomyoma in their heart. And so they find it on, um, on ultrasound. And then you say, um, you follow them. And as soon as they have an abnormal EEG, you put them on medicine and they're going to follow them out. They're going to see what they look like when they're two. They're going to see, do we really prevent the epilepsy? And do we prevent, so the kid never had a seizure. They just got treated for their EEG. And then we see what their development looks like. So that's very exciting. Um, and then, you know, this EI imbalance, you know, can it be altered? And then what's the critical period, right? If it's before we even know the kid has autism, it's not going to be helping us. But, but I think um, those are the kinds of things. I have lots of clinical research questions we can talk about if you want to. 
Um, uh, but uh, this is kind of where I think we are. I think the, the clinicians in the group need to understand the prevalence and the phenotypic descriptions a little bit better. We need to develop these targeted, maybe mechanistic treatments, and we need to understand the genetics and the molecular mechanisms and, and, and kind of doing pathway analysis. So that's it. I will stop.